D. Batum last last night work. Um, uh, we were pretty much uh, pretty much waiting for the tour to end. Um, we had just watched the World Series game. I know the day before um, was Jimmy's Hines um, six month meal, so you know that that went well. That was nice. So we come in for our last night work, and I believe we got dispatched around about I don't know a little after midnight, I think, um, for outside wires. A, a lot of people probably don't even know this, but it we originally got dispatched for outside wires. So we we roll up um, to 68th and 16th Street, I believe it was. Got there. Um, Wires were arcing pole to pole intermittently. Um, Lieutenant McElvain told us to uh, cordon off the area with caution tape. So we did that. He called um, for Pico and a police car to, um, to hold the scene, but the police car never showed up. So we were probably there for about a half hour when a guy across the street comes out his house and he he um he gets the lieutenant's attention and asks him, you know, what was going on over there. So Lieutenant McElvain went over to talk to him and that's when he noticed that there was smoke coming out the guy's house and around the basement area. McElvain was like, well let's go in and see what's going on in your house, sir. Elderly gentleman. So Myself, Jimmy Hines, and Lieutenant McElvain, we go inside to, to investigate. Now, once we walked inside the door, there was clear visibility in the house. No smoke on the first floor. We noticed that the guy was had like hoarding conditions in his, in his property. So the, it was, he had stuff piled up like furniture, um, books, magazines, all clothes, all kinds of stuff just piled up from from the living room, dining room, and towards the kitchen with a path that led back to the rear of the house. So as we were walking to the back of the house to, I guess, go down to the basement, the gentleman says, um, my uh, son is upstairs. He's, he's mentally challenged. So at that point, Mac Lane turns to me and says, Dave, go get the guy from upstairs and get him out, okay. I escorted him out the house and also the elderly gentleman came with me and took them across the street. At that point, I returned to come back into the house and I met in the dining room by Lieutenant McElvain. He says, we need to get the booster line. So we go out, get our packs, grab the booster line and go back in. So now McElvain turns to me and he says, you know what, we're going to need the inch and three quarter. So now I come back out to get the inch and three quarter. We had it set up so that the driver, the, the third guy would always help the driver back up, the pack guy would always help the driver back up. That's how Lieutenant McElvain wanted to, to run it. And so I come outside and tell Ted, you know, we need to get the inch and three quarter. And he says to me, well, what's going on in there? I said, I don't know. I think the lieutenant probably saw something, you know, that he so now he wants to institute three quarter. So Ted tells me, so he says, well, you know, we're going to have to back the truck up if we do an inch three quarter. So help me back the truck up. Was that the right move at the time? I'm not sure. Maybe about six lengths or three inch to the hydrant down the street and around the corner hooked up to the hydrant, got back to the truck. Now at this point, I grabbed an inch and three quarter to go into the dwelling. So now I noticed that there's fire coming from the basement window. So I do a quick knockdown of that. And just as I'm starting to go in, Ted, the driver comes up to me, he says, Dave, um, I haven't heard from the lieutenant in a while. 
this must have set off a red flag to Ted that, look, yeah, we ain't heard from the in a while. And me being a new guy, I'm like, oh, okay. So he, he says, what I'm gonna do is call in a tactical box. I said, oh, okay, if you, if you think that's what needs to happen, he said, yeah, I'm gonna I'm call in a tactical box. At this point, I start to go in trying to advance the a charge inch and three quarter. That's in this hoarding conditions. I'm trying to advance an inch and three quarter through the through the living room towards the dining room, and then now I'm getting bogged down. So now at that point, I can't move it anymore. So now I follow the booster line to towards the kitchen, and it's leading down to the basement steps. And I'm looking, and at now at this point, visibility is low. I got outside light coming from, I don't know, I guess the street lights or whatever from the outside. I have no light. So now I'm still trying to look down there and I'm yelling, I'm calling for them. No one answers. So now I go back to my inch and three quarter and still trying to advance it. And at that point is when the Lieutenant from uh, Lab 29 approaches me and says, what, what are you doing? And I said, I'm trying to get to my guys down in the basement. And he says, yo, 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 get, get out. <laughs> so I head towards the front door. And just as I'm coming out, the chief meets me and he says, where you guys at? I believe they in the basement, chief. Well, why didn't you tell me they were missing? And that's when it, it really dawned upon me that, yo, know, things is not really, really going the way they should have been. But maybe should have, I should have thought about that sooner, that like, yo, what the hell's going on? This ain't right. But the driver picked up on it sooner than, than I did, than being a new guy. He, he was like, so before I went in with inch three quarter, like I said, he was like, well, I'm calling for a tactical box. That's when his red flag went off, because he's like, like, dude, I ain't heard from Lieutenant in a while. When I started realizing things weren't the way they should have been going is when I, I yelled down to the basement and I ain't hear anything. And I went back to try to move it into three quarter some more. And that's pretty much the way the story went until they pulled the guys out. I found out later on that they were in the kitchen. I was also in the kitchen, but I had no light, so I didn't see them. So they were right there in the same room as, as I was. So not having the light, not being able to see them, Um, they were two outstanding guys. Um, Jimmy, <laughs> Jimmy was a nice guy. Um, we'll give you the shirt off his, off, off his back. We'll help you out with anything that you needed. Um, real nice dude, Navy, Navy vet. Lieutenant McIlvain, um, came in to the platoon. Um, this is before Jimmy got there and just started immediately, you know, training, we were doing routine training, trying to get me up to speed to um, to become a pump operator. Um, so once Jimmy got there, we just fell into a routine and we would, we would train one day and then maybe on the second day work, go visit like the daycares in the neighborhood and, and talk, to, talk to the kids, talk to the kids about fire prevention. Great, great family guys. Uh, I remember um, Tim McElwain's wife would stop by and uh, bring his daughter sometimes. Um, nice family, nice, nice family. Um, two great guys. 
There's been a lot of changes in the department over the years. Like one one big thing is the communication. And I'm saying that from the standpoint of the only person that had a radio was the officer. So now each firefighter has a radio with an emergency activation button on it if you get in trouble. If we all had radios, maybe we could have uh, made communications with the lieutenant. Probably could have worked out a little bit better. Now we have a RIT team to go save guys. We have May Day procedures now, which, which we didn't have before. Now we do two and two for basement fires. The, in, when I started, we had the inner spiral packs. So with the inner spiral, you would have to turn the bottle on and it was a separate pass device. The pass device was, was not active if you didn't turn it on. So nowadays you have the bottle so once you turn the bottle on, it activates the pass device on the packs that we have now. It's been it's been a lot of changes um, over the years. Lessons that I picked up from that. Always uh, be aware of what's going on around you. If a situation goes from routine to not routine, be aware of that. <laughs> don't don't think of anything as just routine. Um, it can change real quick. It usually does. Things things can can absolutely change within an instant. As I started driving, I started. I would check on the guys. At, at, if, if if I thought they were in there for a while and I ain't heard anything from them, I would go. I would stick my head in the door and find out what the hell's going on. That's stemming from what happened with me. So. You know, like, hey, is everything all right in here? Whether it was fumes runs, wires, whatever, you know, I would stick my head at the door and make sure everything was all right, especially if, and the shoe runs, especially if they in there for a while. Like, what's going on? Everything good? Okay, everything's good, so I'll go back outside. If something happens to you, please communicate it to everybody else that's around on the fire ground, whatever, whatever. Hit you, don't be scared to hit your emergency activation button because if you if you think things are going bad, this, they probably already are bad. Between the radio, the pack, guys standing in communication with the radio and having a light, three things that really could have probably made a difference that night.